Hello, doctor. Um, so in Australia, I, I'm too junior to be specializing. Um, I've just done general medical and general surgical um, emergency protection. What do you want to do? Uh, in the medical world, I'm interested in uh, radiology and neurology. I'm Herman. Um, yeah. Barry. Chen. So this is going to be like uh, more of an intro level of, about what's going on in this field, uh, a little bit of history as well, and kind of where we've been, and, and, and then more importantly, why cancer immunotherapy was named the biggest breakthrough in 2013. And here being in the Bay Area, it's been very exciting because there's so many biotechs, and there's you know, Stanford and um, UCSF and um, Berkeley that have labs that are working in this area, so it's, it's really good to have a little background of what people are working on, and, and sometimes, you know, if you hear some of these names, um, you can kind of connect the dots and be like, oh, that's what they're working on. Um, a little bit about myself, um, I'm a scientist currently working at Sutro Biopharma, which is a small biotech company in South San Francisco, um, and I'm doing protein engineering and doing some of the things um, that I'll be presenting. I'm not going to go in detail what we do, so that's mostly confidential. Um, but I, I could talk more about my PhD research, which was done at the Scripps Research Institute um, in, in a field called chemical biology, which is essentially like engineering of biology, so you're using chemicals to re-engineer biology. Um, so kind of like synthetic biology, but synthetic tends to be more on the DNA side, whereas this is a little more protein side and more of like the cell in general. I um, also did my BS at um, Indiana University in Bloomington. Contact information, which I'll put up later if you want to talk offline more about these things. Um, so for today, we, we're going to talk about cancer, kind of the history of the treatments that are currently out, um, then getting into the antibody therapeutics, which has been very exciting as a promising way to cure cancer in the last couple of years. We'll talk about which ones are currently available and what they do. And then more recently, there's antibody drug conjugates and bispecific antibodies. Um, which only in the last like two years have really started hitting the market, and um, they're, they're also a really interesting kind of the next generation of the um, antibody therapeutics. And then lastly, we're going to talk about the exact re um, cancer immunotherapies that uh, science highlighted as being the big breakthroughs, which are in the realm of immune checkpoint inhibitors and T cell engineering, um, using actually using viral vectors to engineer. So a little bit on cancer, which actually this is a very beautiful slide. <laughs> um, but you know, cancer is a really ugly disease, actually, and um, and cancer is is a class of disease with the general um, characteristic that's an overgrowth of the cell, and your cells are supposed are scheduled to grow at certain rates and then scheduled to die, and cancer is when those cells do not die, and hence they take off. So your body already has a whole bunch of checkpoints, um, both in your immune system, but then also within each cell. There's a lot of checkpoints of when the cell is supposed to die. In this case, um, usually it takes multiple mutations that will then cause the cancer cell to kind of take off and just continuously replicate. And so one of the first things it does is it somehow bypasses those natural checkpoints. So it bypasses your immune system um, and it you know, turns off those um, deregulating um, checkpoints. And a lot of, um, and so far what we know with cancers, like there's there's definitely some cancers that are genetic, um, such as breast cancer, BRCA1 and 2, <coughs> highly related to your genes. Um, there's environmental factors, such as smoking, you know, that's very highly correlated with your cancer. Um, and then the other things like radiation from UV could cause skin cancer. 
Um, and, but the main challenge with cancer is because every single cancer is so different, even the same type of cancer, within the same type, there's always some types of cancer that are very, very different, that um, it's really hard to find, a single, find the root cause. And if you don't know the cause, then it's going to be hard to, to correct that. Um, so, so there's really not a universal cancer drug that just cures all cancers. And so that's been a huge challenge, trying to find these individual cure, cures. Um, cancer has been around since the dawn of man, um, but it does seem like it's been more of a thing recently, and I think that's partly because we've been able to extend our lives so much um, with you know, hygienic hygiene and um, getting rid of various other bacterial infections that now we're seeing to, like this is the next big thing to tackle because we're now seeing a lot of it and um, trying to, you know, to think, able to cure the easier to cure diseases. Um, so the original treatments for cancer um, for centuries has just been palliative care, which literally means you just calm the patient and make them feel good before they die because there was really no cure. Um, and this was back before you know, surgery was even an option. But um, as medical practices and sanitation got better, um, people did start to use surgical surgical um, procedures, which of course makes a lot of sense. If you if there's a you know, large growth on your skin, then you cut it off. But, um, but obviously, that doesn't really help when you go into internal organs. It's, it's sometimes it becomes a lot more tricky. And then also, cancer has a way of metastasizing. So it leaves the origin of the cancer and basically starts flowing in your bloodstream. And then it goes everywhere. It can, and then it usually resides in certain places. But and then that kind, of, <coughs> that kind of a cancer is really, really difficult to treat. And even today, is still a huge challenge. Um, there's also radiation therapy, which with the idea of if we can blast radiation to a certain area, hopefully those cells will mutate enough that they'll die. Um, and that's definitely uh, another option. And then more recently, we have the chemotherapy, which essentially is just chemical agents of drugs that you would take into your body, and then they would go and um, do various things um, in your body. So chemotherapy, um, the father of chemotherapy, um, has been attributed to Sidney Farber, who maybe you've heard of his name before in Dana Farber Cancer Institute out of Boston. He was the founder of that institute. Um, and what he did was he basically saw that in World War I, there was a chemical that was mustard gas that um, was seen to suppress blood pressure. And it was used as chemical warfare. So he took analogs of this mustard gas molecule and was able to treat lymphoma patients. So by basically yeah, suppressing the, the growth of those blood cancer cells. So since cancers tend to be rapidly dividing cells, a lot of these chemotherapy agents tend to target those rapidly dividing cells, so the ones in mitosis. So it's either usually going after the DNA and trying to cause damage to the DNA, or it's attacking some kind of cellular machinery that affects the division of the cell. So these are some of the main classes of, of chemotherapy agents. These are all small molecule agents. Um, so we have like alkylating agents, so these oftentimes either um, do some chemical modification to the DNA itself, or it kind of weasels its way within the DNA and then causes disruption when, when the DNA tries to replicate. Um, so something like doxorubicin falls in that first category, if you've heard of that, it's been used as a, as a drug. Um, there's anti-metabolites, another class that's been popular is the anti-microtubule agents, and um, these are, like tubulin, are basically the framework of a cell. They, um, they're yellow, yeah, kind of like a, yeah, the, the framework. So, so if you inhibit those tubulin as they're being made, it causes the cell to collapse on itself. So that's, that's why that one um, is pretty effective as a toxin molecule. Uh, and then there's also topoisomerase inhibitors, which um, it affects the unwinding of the DNA. Um, so if you cause a breaks, um, you can damage the DNA. But more than really framework, the uh, tubulin is important in mitosis when mm -hmm. you're right. segregating whole chromosomes. So this is the point where the cell is absolutely dependent on these things. And merely mucking that up can cause some of them to be popped up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so 
So one of the so one of the problems with small molecules in general is that in this case they're trying they're hoping that the cancer cell takes up more of the small molecule. But one of the problems is that these are small these molecules can get into theoretically can get into every cell in your body. Um, so it's it's not extremely um, tar targeted. Um, and so there's a lot of side effects, as you know, with cancer therapy or chemotherapy. That one of the first things is that most chemotherapy patients lose their hair because um, that's those hair follicles are, tend to be very sensitive to a lot of these molecules. Um, there's been a lot of issues with immune that the immune system gets blown out. Um, you know, obviously <coughs> lots of nausea and, and other kinds of um, other kinds of discomfort. And then other things like doxorubicin has also been seen to cause a lot of heart damage and heart failure. Um, so there's definitely risks in taking a lot of these drugs. So there's been obviously a push to say, well, can we make these drugs a little more targeted, a little more so that they can go only to the cancer and not affect the rest of your body? And indeed, um, there's been a lot of work in trying to make small molecules to, to target more specifically. Uh, so in this case, these are tyrosine kinase inhibitors. It's not showing up very well. But, um, this tyrosine kinase inhibitor is a class, if you've heard of the, the drug Gleevec, um, it's one of the big cancer drugs, um, and it's for chronic um, myelogenic leukemia. And so the, 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 in that particular case, um, there's a lot of this, this protein being made, and it's not great. <laughs> um, and so you can more specifically target uh, the cancer. So now I'm going to shift gears <coughs> to antibodies and how antibodies really played in um, to this whole system. So, so these drugs have been in development for a long time, and, and in parallel, you know, a lot of people, scientists, have been starting to realize um, the various things that the immune system can do. Um, and one of the first scientists who did this was William Coley, and he. Used, uh, he manipulated the immune system by having bacterial um, products and having those attack cancer. I'm actually not sure. Um, yeah. And um, so, so he kind of founded the idea that you could use some kind of agent to manipulate the immune system. And then Paul Aldrich is um, also well regarded as coming up with the concept of magic bullet. And at the time, he it was just a concept. It was, well, why if we can make something that magically targets just the cancer. Um, and he didn't actually have anything that could actually do that at the time, but people attribute him to being an early um, idea person around antibodies because antibodies have kind of fulfilled what he was talking about. Um, and then really antibody technology didn't really take off <coughs> until um, Milstein and Kohler in 1975 when they developed hybridoma technology. Um, because previously when you try to make antibodies, um, it, was, it, it was very difficult to make a single type of antibody. You would basically inject a vaccine or inject an agent and your body would try to try to um, make antibodies against it. But when it does that, so if you have your vaccine molecule here, um, you end up making antibodies to all directions of this antigen. Um, and hence, so the result, you have a very heterogeneous product that could be attack attacking a lot of different, or binding to a lot of different areas. So the idea was that, well, we, in order to make a real drug, we really need something that only binds one place. And so um, these two were able to develop this technology that caused, that allowed for the production of monoclonal antibodies, monoclonal being that there's one, one type of antibody. Um, so a little more about antibodies, um, I kind of mentioned that. So antibodies are naturally made in our body. They're made from B cells. Um, and you can, you can see how it works with vaccines and, and generally foreign agents in general that end up getting into our system is that it induces this huge like mechanism where the B cells go through like this maturity stage, stage in order to make antibodies. And once these antibodies are made, the antibodies circulate your bloodstream and then basically go find the, the, the uh, foreign agent. And when they do find the foreign agent, they basically neutralize it. Um, so, so the antibody has a couple characteristics. It's oftentimes you know, seen as kind of a Y shape. So it has the two, the two binding regions on top, and they're they're usually they're identical. 
Um, and then they're kind of anchored together by this FC portion. So the top portion, each one of these is called FAB, standing for fragment antibody binding. And then this bottom portion is called FC, which stands for fragment crystallizable. Um, the reason it's called crystallizable because it was the first fragment they were able to crystallize and determine the structure of. So a lot of these nomenclature just kind of got passed down. Um, and so this FC is actually pretty important too because it has a bunch of different activities, one of which is called ADCC, antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, and that actually can draw other cells in to kill things. Um, there's also CDC, complement-dependent cytotoxicity. Um, another thing is FC recycling, and, and this Basically, it causes this whole antibody to be to circulate in your system a lot longer by being taken into a cell and then later being presented back out. So it basically causes this molecule to be um, to stay in your system for a, for a long time, usually up to like three to six weeks. Another thing that's not shown here is that this is, this is all protein, but there's also glycine and also affects dosing. There's there's a lot of things that kind of affect that. Um, Right, so I mean, even these drugs, like, they're very promising drugs, but none of these drugs are 100% cure rate. And, um, and especially with cancer, um, the hallmark is more about extending life than true cures, because truly curing cancer is actually very hard. Um, so especially like with leukemia and stuff, it's like, if you are able to extend someone's life by a couple of months, that's um, enough to be a marker of a drug. Obviously, it's up to the patient as to whether they want to spend the money to take this drug to extend their life. Um, so, <clears throat> the next class we're going to talk about five specific antibodies, and kind of um, what you were talking about earlier is people have seen that if you can put two different antibodies, it could actually have complementary additive effects. So, for example, one idea is why if we make a molecule that now binds two different targets? But why if we, why if we have target the same cell? Well, why would you want to do this? One of the problems with cancer is because it's rapidly mutating and rapidly growing, oftentimes if you just give it a drug, <clears throat> it's going to develop resistance. So if you only had one, like this blue antigen being targeted, why if it just escape, it, you know, mutates and then no longer is susceptible to this drug, now this molecule then has the added effect that it can also bind this other orange target. So you're just maximizing the efficacy and to, to make sure that you can kill more cells. Um, so this was one idea, but then another idea is, uh, well, if we make this antibody that binds two different things, why don't we have it bind two different cells? So why would we, uh, well, what can we do with that? And in this case, what we want, what people have seen is that you can bring in a T cell to the cancer. So remember earlier, one of the first things that the cancer does is it turns off its recognition by, to the immune system. It, it makes it so that it's invisible. Um, but the can cells, our T cells are obviously the, our natural killer cells that um, are very good at seeking out and finding and, and destroying things. But by having this antibody here, we now cause the T cell to re-recognize the cancer. Uh, and so that's kind of one of the main mechanisms and one of the main drugs out there. So if you look at the left side here, if we have a tumor cell, this is naturally we would have a tumor cell here and our T cell here, and they, they engage in this kind of recognition signal. And when this recognition signal happens, the, um, the T cell then kills the tumor cell. But in, oftentimes the tumor cell, they usually mess up this complex so that it cannot be recognized. And so what we introduce here is our drug, this bispecific antibody, and it, it bypasses the traditional mechanism. It kind of cheats by going and interacting with this side mechanism. But they've seen, kind of serendipitously, that it actually triggers the same effect. So they call, call it a pseudosynaptic effect. Um, because it's not, not a real effect, but for some reason, it's still, it's still tr it, 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 the T cell thinks it's getting the same signal. And then it causes it to be activated and then kills the tumor cells. Um, and so one of the things is with, um, with the antibodies earlier, we talked about how um, they're made from like hybridoma technology and there's a lot of technology involved. This kind of bispecific antibody is not natural. 
um, we had to make it. Um, and so there's a lot of engineering involved with trying to make different formats of bi-specific antibodies. Um, and that's kind of an exciting field and one, one thing that I'm kind of involved with because um, you've heard of like DNA origami. So this is kind of like protein origami um, where you can mix and match and try to try to like make these. Um, and, and that's the making of them in, in itself is a, still a big challenge right now. Um, and then with all these different formats, you can see that they're different sizes and they all kind of have different characteristics. And so a lot of research is still being done around what's the best format, how can we induce like half-life to make sure it stays in our body longer or, or different kinds of characteristics. Um, there has been one approved molecule that's kind of in this format here. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's approved in, the, in Europe for non-Hopkins lymphoma and acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And currently it's in trials in the US. Um, this was a, a company that actually Amgen just bought. So Amgen's really pushing for um, the approval in the US. So hopefully you know, this year or next it should be um, on the market here. Um, so we talked about a lot of different types of antibodies and uh, antibody drug conjugates, bispecific antibodies. So, but those kind of were, I mean, those were like 2012. So they're still really, really recent. But that's, those things were not why science decided to make cancer immunotherapy um, the drug of the year last year, or the breakthrough of the year. Um, so next I'm gonna talk about the two things that, that they really highlighted as being why this field is super exciting right now. The first one, um, involved this drug called Uruboy, um, which uh, was approved in 2011. Um, I'm going to break this down because it's a really big image. Um, so when, so yeah, going to what you were talking about with, with just overactivation of your T cells. Um, so naturally, T cells, they're, they're natural killer cells. They are, sorry, they're, they're our killer cells. Um, but there's a tight regulation around them because we have to switch them on when we want them to be active, but we also need, want to switch them off um, because if they become overactive, that's also bad because it can, it can do um, various damaging things to your body. So we have a lot of checkpoints in our body that, turn, that are designed to turn, turn the T cells on and turn the T cells off. So one of which is to activate the T cell and turn it on, um, usually it binds this antigen presenting cell um, so this antigen presenting cell usually presents an antigen, so something that's foreign, um, and, and there's this recognition signal, and then there's this, the side recognition si signal of the CD28 and CD80, and when this, these complexes come together, the T cell gets activated. It's, so, it's, so now it's ready to go and find, seek out this antigen and destroy the antigen. But one thing that happens when it turns on, a whole bunch, a, a bunch of the morphology changes. It actually starts expressing a lot of other proteins, and one of the things it expresses is this molecule called CTLA4, which stands for Cytotoxic T Lymphocyte Agent Antigen 4, um, very generic name. Um, and so now these T cells have the CTLA4 displayed on the surface of them, and the CTLA4 is essentially like a, a, an off button waiting to be pressed. And what happens is when there's a lot of CTLA-4, it then maybe it binds another um, antigen presenting cell. And CTLA-4 actually binds CD80 as well. So basically it displaces the binding of CD80 to CD28, and instead it causes the CD80 to bind CTLA-4. And when that happens, it essentially turns off the T cell. So um, we were talking about because like the antibody, or because cancer evades the immune system, it basically causes itself to be unrecognizable by the immune system. And so the immune system is oftentimes turned off. So oftentimes T cells are being turned off. So we don't want that. We want the T cells to be active, and we want it to go around and seek out the, the bad cells. So that's what this antibody does. This antibody, instead, it binds to CTLA-4, and essentially it blocks it. It blocks it from contacting CD80 to be turned off. That's okay. <laughs> Sorry, does this, so does this activate um, phagocytosis? So it like takes. So well, so it, it keeps the T cells on. Okay. T turned on um, to, to be killer T cells, and then so. Oh, killer T cells. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, it just makes. It just general. changes the phenotype, like. 
So if it's just like if they similar to like yeah, map applications. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, it, it keeps it on versus it, it makes it more hyperactive, which is what um, this CD forty seven mm -hmm. CD forty seven does as well. Um, so this, this is molecule, which is portrayed here again, um, is a very similar to um, another one that um, this molecule here, PD PD one. Um, PD-1 is also an off switch, and PDL one its partner, is oftentimes on tumor cells as well. So this is, this is where the tumor cell makes this molecule to go around and turn off T cells purposely. And so if we have an anti-PD-1 antibody or an anti-PDL1 antibody that blocks this interface, then we can keep the T cells on. Um, and so this this molecule in particular was one of the big breakthroughs um, of last year because it's, it's not out on the market yet, but there was very, very promising phase three, and also there's another molecule in phase two that showed really promising results. Um, so hopefully it'll be out soon, but um, it, these are for um, melanoma, um, also like renal cancer and non-small lung carcinoma. Um, yeah, and, and so you know, people are extremely excited that this this actually potentially could work um, as a cancer therapy. And then the last um, class of drugs. Sorry, um, just to back, does yeah. that work by itself, or do you need to? Mm -hmm. So just turning off the CT, CTLA-4 is sufficient to? Right. They, to get. I, think it, I think it depends on the cancer. And um, it seems like melanoma is, responds really well to this type of treatment. Um, but yeah, for for uh, melanoma, they have seen that just by reactivating or having keeping your T cells on, um, it will naturally kill the cancer. And it's going to depend on the individual's like tumor cell array. Like, like what are the tumor cells like upregulating? What are they downregulating? Which varies like individual to individual. Right. So I'm just curious if like somebody's doing like you know. Kind of genetic profiles towards like like is there mapping going on? Is there like um, kind of like a system that's being applied like bioinformatics wise to kind of categorize like what we see as a pattern if there even is one because you know it's just a hot genetic mess. Yes. So um, yeah, that's definitely ongoing um, both in like academic labs as well as some of the big biotechs are definitely um, interested in that. So we talked eventually about the five hallmarks of cancer, the five um, achievements. A uh, cell must cross to be diagnosed as a real monster um, for only looking at the genes. Um, but the, what might be the sixth is genetic um, instability. Uh, and now maybe the seventh is that they are actively suppressing T cell killers. Uh, because the only cancers we diagnose are the ones that our T cells haven't already wiped out before we got to diagnose them. So yes, there is the growing sense that Cancer's happening all the time, and usually your immune system's wiping it out before you ever saw it. And if you can just uh, block PD-1 or CTLA-4, um, you can um, let your immune system back in. But I think that's kind of a short-sighted view because um, there is such a different uh, expression profile depending on the cancer. That's what I was kind of pointing at. And yeah, I'm aware of the hallmarks of cancer that uh, Weinberg pointed out with the Whitehead Institute. Um, I think we are up to six, though, as a template. The genetic now. instability is usually is now usually added. Yeah, six. it's accepted. So the seventh would now be uh, T cell blockade. But yeah, I, mean, I think like you know the problem is that you have like so many different types of things that get expressed. So you know just focusing on PD one or CTLA four, it only represents some types of cancer, and then you know it's only like maybe 30, 60 percent of the people who are diagnosed with that. So that's kind of the distinction I was pointing out, that there's really no one cure-all kind of approach here. There certainly yes. is not, but that's not because of the expression. Uh, PD-1 or CTLA are going to block T cell killing of any cancer. So that what they're exciting exactly because they're not pointing at a single defect of the cancer, per se. They're pointing to a single defect of the immune response to it. Well, it depends on what's getting upregulated by the tumor cell. No, it doesn't. Exactly. Well, okay, so can you extrapolate them? Oh, yeah, I might not be understanding it fully. Okay, so I, I guess um, we were talking about antibodies binding um, certain types of cancer, so like with the antibody drug conjugates, it was very much a delivery mechanism. 
you have to have that receptor on the surface of your cell in order for the antibody to work. In this case, um, because it's it's basically manipulating your immune system, it doesn't really it doesn't depend on the cancer's profile. It's more of dependent on the T cells profile, um, and in this case. T cells because they have all these mechanisms pretty well characterized that most of our T cells have these, unless it's a T cell cancer, then that makes sense. So, so are we just talking about like um, uh, natural expression of PDLA1 um, or LA1 and B7 that is on the tumor cell, like bar none, that's going to um, be there? Well, because that's what I'm bringing up is like. Yeah. Because you said, you know, only these types of cancers and then only a percentage of it, right. which makes me think that it is what's on the surface of the term. Yeah. Um, I, Sorry I, to digress the oh, point, no, no, but no, I no, just no, want to understand it holistically. That's good. Um, I, I think, so these two molecules do get expressed on some cancers, and it's the cancer's way of shutting a mechanism in which the cancer right. can shut off the immune system. But independent of this, even if you, your cancer cell doesn't have these two molecules, the fact that we're bringing in these two antibodies, they're still activating the T cell. So ignore the side of the cancer side. Mm -hmm. um, even if the cancer is not manipulating the T cell, we're just across the board activating just, the T cells. Exactly. We're across. So you're so you're making the immune system more hyperactive. Yes. But if it's by this is where I'm getting confused because if it's by specific, you're also targeting a tumor cell profile. Right. Right. So, so that's it's a kind different. of a combined. Well, the by specific molecule is a different. Molecule. Okay, so so this specific case, yeah. we're not talking about a bi specific case. Right, we're not. We're yeah. just talking Sorry. about antibody. Yeah. Okay. okay. Right. Yeah, so that was the confusion. Yeah, we we've, we've jumped through a lot of different things. Okay. So yeah, sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> um, the, yeah. Um, so this thing this it's just blocking. So this is just the to activate the T cell. Right. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad I clarified. Thank okay. you. Yeah, no, no, that's good to bring up. Sorry for yeah. Does this make this more likely to have autoimmune? <laughs> <laughs> um Yes, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that's kind of scary. Like you're activating right. oh, yeah. all the like, T cells across the <laughs> oh, yeah. board. Yeah. You're doing this in dying patients where you think that risk is worth playing. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Right. Okay. So, um, and then the last um, uh, portion I'm going to talk about. Um, this girl was one of a very small handful of people who have gone through a treatment um, called CARS, um, Chimeric Antigen Receptor Technology. Um, she, she had leukemia when she was six, and she went through this very experimental technology. Um, and it was, it was kind of led by this guy named Carl June out of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I bring them up because he's kind of famous, and she, she's also, she had her own profile in like New York Times and everything. Um, and what this technology was, it was very experimental and and he personally really treated just a couple of patients with this technology, um, is where you take T cells. Um, so pe people have done where they take someone else's T cell and implant it into a different patient before and basically hoping that the other person's T cell will be active and go and, and um, destroy the cancer, but every time you transfer cells between people, there's always rejection problems. And, um, so the idea was, why if you can activate your own T cells, so what he did was extract the patient's T cells, put it in a, in a Petri dish, um, and basically manipulate the genes of those T cells by using like a viral system. So by introducing this virus, we, he actually was able to manipulate the genes, and the, now the, the new genes of the, the of these T cells express a molecule on the surface. And then he would put these T cells back into the patient. So now the patient has their own cells, but now they're displaying this extra molecule that will hopefully go find the tumor. And so what, what is the molecule that they're putting in? It's actually an antibody. Like what we were talking about before, it's just the top, top portion of the binding portion of an antibody and then it's fused to this other, this receptor that's what we were looking at earlier um, in the T cell. So that, that's why it's chimeric, is because he made this fusion. And in essence, what, what happened then is that your T cells now have this permanent antibody on the surface. So then if the T cells now recognize the tumor cell, which has the antigen for, for um, for whatever the antibody is binding, um, 
and then hones in on the T cell. So, you're probably so this is why it's only a few people because it's a very highly personalized treatment. Uh, yes, well, I think they're only doing it in leukemia right now, but but also it's it's highly risky. Um, there's there's a lot of factors because T cells actually stay in your body for a long time. They mm -hmm. they kind of have memory and stuff. So essentially. The, the patients that got this treatment, they have a small percentage of these T cells left in them for like many, well, since, since it's been done, I don't know when they did this. Um, but it's been, yeah, going on for a couple of years now. And so they still keep track to see whether they're So what you're doing is you're engineering an autoimmune attack. Yeah. Uh, which is sort of a troublesome thing. Uh, yeah, it's You want it's to be very important. careful in choosing your target. Right. Um, this one, it, it's, it's, it's very, very important. But it's. We only did this for B cell leukemia. Yeah. So, so the other far. targets are uh, um, CD, whatever it was. It was targeting CD19? I think? Yeah. And it's, yeah. And it's known, other, it, it was already known that you can survive for quite a long time without any B cells. And so they chose a target that they were willing to delete all. And they did. Mm -hmm. So the, I kind of wonder whether it will work for, like, Melanoma, for example, you can't right. use them. No, 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 there are very few tissues okay. that you're willing to delete the way they deleted the B cells. Um, you could delete, for instance, pancreatic beta cells. We know that you can live for decades without pancreatic beta cells. That's no, that's a, an autoimmune attack that you can survive. Um, but that really limits the number of possible cancers you can target this way. Yeah. And then I think in, in a few of the patients, the the leukemia had a mutant form of the CD19. Okay. And the cancer was able to come back. Yeah. But in only a few mm -hmm. cases. So. I mean, you, you're all, always going to do that because when you're targeting one thing, you're going to have mutations that you know, yeah. bypass whatever you're targeting, and those could take off. Um, that's, that's, that's kind of the challenge with targeted therapy, too, is that if you have a generic therapy, then maybe you could attack all the, all the cancers, but then when you're doing it targeted, you get the trade-off of being more safe and more specific, but then it could be too specific. If you really are that safe, you could rethink the whole field. Right now, we don't start treating cancers until they display all the hallmarks, which mm -hmm. is to say, you're already genetically unstable, they got hundreds of other things going on too. Um, Dermatologists don't wait for that. They see a lesion and they cut it off because yeah. their treatment is very safe. Yeah. Uh, if this were really that safe, yes, you could go in. Once you have the regulations, Jimmy, uh, and you could attack these things very specifically and mm -hmm. hopefully very safely uh, before you have all this genetic instability and therefore your chance of uh, of resistance escape uh, would be much less. Be but nice. first, you have to be very, very <laughs> clean <laughs> to yeah. convince anyone to, to allow you to treat so early. We're working on that, but, but fundamentally, no one believes that you ought to treat that early, except in dermatology, where they where they trust that the knife or the uh, cryoprobe is very clean. Mm -hmm. And there's other things too, like um, with the. Uh, cervical cancer vaccine, basically. But that's, that's very different because it's, it's, it's different. correlated to um, a virus, right? And then you're just in the immune, are doing immune system as a virus. Um, but yeah, so I mean, with these cancers, like all the causes are different, and that's why every single drug essentially is very different um, at the strategy which to attack the cancer. Um, okay. So wrapping this up, I'm almost done. It, um, so looking at this, you might be thinking, well, it's, this is very similar to bi-specific antibodies, and indeed, it's pretty much the same concept, um, except in this case, the T cells are actually engineered with the antibody, whereas this, you're using your natural T cells and you're coming in with a molecule to direct the, um, the engineering. So, um, so this has been seen to be extremely potent, but maybe this is better because then it's not permanent, right? Like you can basically stop dosing the drug and hopefully your T cells won't continuously go after the B cell in this case. Um, so there's a lot of these you know, different technologies that are all kind of um, going simultaneously and um, we'll see you know, what, uh, how well they do. Um, and one thing about the uh, CARS technology that is really exciting is that um, I think just a couple months ago, um, a company was formed called Juno out of Seattle 
and they got $120 million to develop this technology and bring it more to market, um, including uh, Amazon's Jeff Bezos actually personally invested in it. So it, it's very exciting that with the preliminary results that people are putting a lot of money into seeing um, what the potentials of this technology um, can do. Uh, so the last slide basically is just so why is this a breakthrough? Because you probably heard me across this um, whole talk to be like, oh, this has been going on for 20 years, and you know, people have, like the idea obviously didn't happen last year. So why why was this a hot topic last year? Um, it's because you know with the way with science and the way with actually getting something into people, it it just takes so long. And people, even though it's been a really great idea about trying to regulate the immune system, it really was last year that that it kind of was proven that this might actually work. Um, and you know, not, it still doesn't work 100%, but the, I, the, it just validates that this idea might be a future for cancer therapy. And because of that, actually just in the last year, all kinds of biotechs and academic labs have really started diving in to this technology further. And so that's very exciting because hopefully in 10 more years, all these different biotechs and labs will be able to come up with more treatments um, to innovate upon the current technologies and to develop drugs against other cancers that can be leveraged on top of these technologies. Um, so it's more of a, it's more of the promise of that um, we're going, at least something's working and you know, we're going down that road. Um, um, yeah, so. so we've had one great success, Valley Food who was an engineered T cell attacking a tissue marker in this little poem. Um, but that's a cell surface marker, and most of the defects in cancers are cytosolic. Mm -hmm. There are, beyond the professional antibody presenting cells, uh, MHC on all sorts of other tissues, which are at some low rate displaying peptide fragments from the cytosol out on the surface. Are those promising? targets for this sort of engineered TCR? I think MHCs are going to be difficult, unless you're, you're actually attacking like the MHC, like the whole section. The peptides are so small and they're volatile, right? Because they, they change a lot depending on what the antigen is. So they're, they're not practical as being a, like a monoclonal therapeutic. Um, not as a therapeutic, as a target for an oh. engineered uh, T cell. Right. Well, you wouldn't be able to make a monoclonal antibody against an MHC, I don't think. Oh. Not against the MHC, against the thing the MHC displays. Right, but because it's so small, it's a peptide. I mean, sure, you, you can make make it, but... Um, How small are those? I, I don't really know if like MHC can speed up. 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 amino acids. Um, I think it, you, you would just get, yeah, you would get a lot of off-target binding develop antibodies against those. So just as a recap, like to cover, um, what were the, were the three main approaches right now with cancer immunotherapy? There's regular antibodies, there's the isospec antibodies, and then we have like this permanent fixture on the T cells. Um, and uh, antibody drug conjugates. Yeah, so there are just antibody therapeutics. Um, I don't know when you came into the talk, but like like Herceptin for breast cancer and, mm -hmm. and stuff. And then um, the immuno the immune checkpoint modulators, the ones that are just upregulating T cells. That's the same type of molecule, but it is tackling at, in a very different mechanism. So. Any other questions? So from a DIY perspective. <laughs> 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 yeah, I know. Originally, um, I was thinking of like trying to propose something, but it's really hard with therapy from a DIY perspective because you can't, you just can't test it. Right? Even in mice, it's going to be such so hard to get the facilities and um, all the paperwork needed to do those kind of studies. Um, I don't think. You, can, you, you can't do it as a therapeutic. However, antibodies are used as diagnostics. Um, pretty much all like microfluidic things tend to be antibody-based diagnostics. Um, and uh, you, you, like ELISA assays and, and 
things like that. Um, so you can definitely, I, I, and I think that's something we should definitely think about and brainstorm around how to use antibodies as like a diagnostic or some kind of um, measurement technique, but um, probably not as full on therapeutics. Um, I mean, you can definitely design antibodies and you know test them out, see what they do on maybe just some cells, right? Um, but, yes. Yeah, 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 you, yeah, you, you, you can do, do that, yeah. Right, but it would be hard to like take it to the next step unless you then find you know, funding or backing or, or um, maybe. Yeah, you can, you can take it too. Well, it seems like for this to like work in reality, mm -hmm. um, like outside of the lab, where you have some of these resources being allocated to specific types that you're, you engineer in the lab, mm -hmm. that when you're thinking about this towards a human populace, like that you're approaching it with data that it has been digested by heavy computing. And so like, I think that this is kind of something that needs to move forward, is that we're kind of on a paradigm shift where like, computing needs to, needs to meet oncology in a big way, and I know that it has, but like, in this specific milieu. Yeah, yeah no, that's, that's definitely, I mean, in, in general, yeah, computing, even with just genomic stuff, we're still at the dawn of that. We haven't really made sense of a lot of information. I think there is a lot of information there. Um, well, and you're asking a lot of people who have, you know, biotech or, you know, um, are MD, PhDs in oncology, you know, like you're asking them now to wear a computing hat, which is a pretty big <laughs> task unless people are capable of collaborating in those two different fields, which is difficult in its own right. So, yeah. But I think even with, yeah, a lot of big pharmaceutical companies, they are starting up informatic, bioinformatic divisions and stuff. Too. Right. Hopefully. Yeah, and off we came through with a list of a rough thousand of memory serves. Genes that are expressed only embryologically and not in the adult. And therefore he figured, in his case he figured, these are probably the genes necessary for uh, turning on uh, real stem cells. And he eventually got down to, down to four, which is great, great trying. But we could look at that same list and we could ask of these, uh, which of them are displayed on the cell surface? Yeah. Because necessarily any adult cell displaying those is messed up. Um, and there will be some cancers which turn those things on, whether they were useful to the cancer or not, just in the course of throwing switches looking for something to escape your drug. So it might be that on uh, Yamanaka's list we will find uh, targets which actually are specific to cancer because the only proper place that they're displayed is on an embryo. Mm -hmm. Or adult, adult stem cells. Are you talking about like focused, like like embryological markers? Or yes. are you talking, okay. I don't know Yamanaka's list. I know of Yamanaka, but yeah. I don't know his list. Yeah, he, he went looking, he said, hey, um, uh, we don't know what, we don't know how to turn, how to make a stem cell. We know that embryos do it. And therefore we conjecture that some of these proteins which are peculiar to embryos are involved, and he put a lot of that, put a lot of work in it, and he got there, um, a tour, tour de force. Um, but he started with a list of proteins which are expressed only by embryos. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we, some of those, presumably, will stick out of the cell membrane, uh, and any of those that you see in an adult might be legitimate markers for, for killing. So there are um, what people are hypothesizing as uh, cancer stem cells, that there, there are some cells that have these kind of embryonic characteristics. Um, so I know there's a marker called CXR4 that is um, for this. Um, yeah. Actually, there's like a lot. You can probably, is, that, is the data from the Cancer Genome Project, is that pretty accessible? I think, his list is, yeah, I think his list is accessible. His list is probably, yeah. but the cancer... How, how you then identify which of those stick out of the cell surface isn't as good thing. There are probably ways to do that. You can see it as being expressed, right? right. In the RNA. Right. Data. That's like a really you know, long process for an individual who's you know, dealing with cancer like in the immediate. So like as far as like treatment modality goes, like how do you take data from an individual and then apply the treatment in real time before they die. Yeah. But I, I guess that's going to have to be down the line, but for now, maybe if we have this data that shows that these are being expressed, 
then it's something that can be pursued. And I think strategically, I would want to add a freezer for all of these engineered TCRs to all these candidates. And then you would ask, which of any of these will work for this patient? Uh, you, you couldn't gear it up after you had a patient. You'd have to have the freezer full of engineered TCRs. So you would, like, logistically, like, I'm always thinking about, like, how these things actually apply, because <laughs> I feel like it's a it's a poor mindset to, like, go into research about thinking about, like, how <laughs> it applies. Yeah, so, so what would you do? Would you get a whole bunch of donors and, like, you know, analyze their tissue samples and then go from there and try and like across the board analyze like what's being upregulated in those cells and, like the cancer stem cells or what? Uh, you start with the yellow to figure out which of those would be sticking out of the cell surface and therefore potentially targets. Uh, you probably would uh, make engineered PCRs to each of those uh, and then you would start querying uh, patients coming in to ask if, if they are in fact displaying one of those. I mean, it's a problem with any of these. Right now, the FDA says that uh, before you have a reimbursable therapy, you have to go through clinicals, phase one, two, three. Uh, and there ain't no phase three uh, if every patient is distinct. And therefore, there's never a reimbursable product. It is always experimental. Um, <laughs> that, that the current funding of healthcare in America uh, really doesn't address those. That's why I like the, the whole gene engineering thing was, yeah, it's only one really handful of people in the business that have experimented. That's cool that um, they were able to do that kind of, and they, and they were doing it you know, on the bedside as well. They were dealing with the patients directly. Um, oh, you're right, strategically looking ahead, but the current funding of healthcare in this country doesn't touch this. Yeah. That's right. And also, yeah, I, personalized medicine is a great idea. In but, theory. <laughs> yeah, but it's, try, if you think about just, yeah, exactly. Like, or it's safe for the rich. I mean, it, yeah, but like the, all the pharmaceutical companies, they're, they're aiming for things that can actually turn a profit, therefore. They're only aiming for the big diseases, all the orphan diseases, the ones that less than 100,000 people in the world have are really getting ignored. And I think people don't know how many diseases cancer is. The nightmare is it's a large number of rare diseases no one of which will actually pay for this process. Yeah. We don't like to believe that. Mm -hmm. We like to think that all cancers have a small number of things in common that we can attack, mm -hmm. and therefore profitably. Uh, so one yeah. of the things that would be interesting is if we can somehow develop a platform, either it be dealing with antibodies or something else, that can actually turn out these individual, um, and, and yeah, and using the platform technology to therapeutics rapidly and more personalized. Um, that would be something interesting to pursue. But, I mean, even now with these antibodies, it's such a huge ordeal to even make one and to then get it through the clinics and everything that the current paradigm that doesn't really allow it. So what do you mean by platform? Can you extrapolate on that? Yeah, um, well, like, so like with antibodies, there's kind of a lot of technology around how you make a new antibody. Um, so if you have a receptor that you, you know um, you want to make an antibody for, you, you go through this whole like technology process to make this antibody. So why do you shrink that process into something that can be made much more rapidly, that can be just directly dosed? Um, and I'm not saying that's necessarily for antibodies, that this is you know, super far out. I think, I think for instance of the flu vaccine, the platform is 19th century technology, chicken eggs inoculated. That's all very well known, and the FDA has already embraced that. So each year, that part's conserved. The whole platform is still the same. And yet the product you're, you're injecting is new each year. Uh, so the FDA has bought your platform. Uh, and what's new is just a particular antigen that, uh, that, that we're going to talk about the end of it. So you're talking about a, a novel platform that would address this issue of very diverse um, uh, it into this existing platform and then out pops the drug. Um, but yeah. Uh, I think in general, that would still take some of the regulatory innovation, <laughs> but, but it's 
the sort of regulatory innovation that you could credibly get through, I think. But what's the current platform? Like, say, say you know, here's here's my receptor target that I know. I want to make an antibody to it. How long? How much money? <laughs> yeah, there's there's a lot of different technologies. Um, some and work, some it, don't. And is it is it a regulatory issue, or is it like there's a fundamental technology and science issue, et cetera? I think it's both. Um, the science is not there, there. There's actually been a lot of antibody drugs that have failed clinics, too, um, which is just natural. And small molecules have that problem, too. Um, so you can't, right now, there's not an exact platform that you can say, like, everything coming out of this is going to be amazing. And then the way regulation happens is they don't really care about Platform, that they're not betting the platform, they're betting the, the output product. Your your, all the regulation is based on what the end product antibody is doing and how it behaves and what it looks like. Um, so you start from scratch each time with the platform. Exactly. So your, your workflow is like, exactly, yeah. <laughs> goes to the wayside if like maybe, you know, this much of the population has a, you know, adverse response. Right. Exactly. The problem is old, right? 30 years ago, people knew it. Oh my God, it takes 10 years and $200 million to get a drug. Uh, no one can afford to get into the business unless you're Monsanto. Uh, you, you have to already be a Pfizer or a Lilly or mm -hmm. No, uh, if we are producing uh, biological molecules that your body was supposed to be making anyway, uh, it's not really a novel drug entity. Um, and therefore, we don't have to have this 10 or 12 year FDA process. And in fact, that gave us rumulin and human growth factor and the erythropoietin and the glucopoietin. So these are the more big success patterns that we're to get from biotech. Uh, and then you got more ambitious and you started designing biologicals. And it's every bit as long as well as expensive as small molecules. It's not more complicated than cancer needles, they are because now you're interacting with immune system, which, as you said, like they're long-lived cells that have lifelong effects. Oh, and one more complexity. Uh, the thing that you actually have licensed is never fully characterized. Yeah. Um, <laughs> by the time you get a small molecule through the FDA, it's highly characterized. Uh, you know how it was made, you know its impurities, you know the toxicity of each of those impurities. It's a known entity. Um, that's not so for a biological in 2014. And so if you open a new plant by the old process, you've got you to demonstrate it's bioequivalent. And if you're trying to go generic on a biological, uh, it's an unsolved problem because you don't know what differences are germane. Degree of aggregation, degree of glycosylation. But it's, so, so you have a novel, you know, novel receptor or whatever you want to target. Is it more an issue of like getting something that works, or is it something that's getting something that's safe? Like, what's the where? Where is? Um, I don't where, think it's one over the other. Well, no, 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 I mean, I mean, you need both, right? But where, where, where is it that things get biology? Like, I mean, I mean, in principle, right? Okay, here's something you want to target, and you know, you want to make the. I mean, it's, I mean, it could be, you know, if your receptor or your target is just completely wrong, okay, you know, right. you're, you're done with, right? But let's say, you know, you have a target identified, and now you want to make some, you know, some antibody to it. What's, what's complicated about making, like, actually turning it through, like, is it yeah. getting something that works, or is it getting something I'd that's say the safety, then? because, I mean, you can inject yourself with side of that, is that what you have to so the, the idea is you have to be able to target the cancer cells without targeting other cells. Okay. Yes, That's the, the, the FDA's general, the the FDA's general safety barrier safety. is they, wanted, they want you to demonstrate safety and efficacy, except for oncology. Because in oncology, they don't believe any of your animal models. They say, until you've been into humans, you can't bring us anything we believe is meaningful. Efficacy, so just clear, clear the safety barrier, and that's a pretty low answer. Um, and try it um, for antibodies too, because they're all a similar scaffold. Um, toxicity is usually not as big of an issue. I think a lot of the a lot of the ones that have failed clinic is because they show no efficacy, um, and and that's how how the process you, you 
you make the drug, you put it in mice first, and like you said, mice doesn't really translate really well, especially, um, especially because a lot of the molecules we're dealing with, they have some kind of immune component, and it's really difficult to recreate a human immune system in a mouse, and to do it in a way where it's like actually giving you real data. Um, so people kind of do that issue too. Yeah. Um, so, so people kind of like put together a mouse study because you have to, to show that it kind of does something, but it's so contrived in essence that um, it, it may or may not actually say anything. So then once you go into phase one clinical trials, it's actually a safe, it's safety, it's a top study. You basically dose to a maximum dose and you see whether your patients kill over or not. Um, and then once you pass that, then it goes into phase two. So it does definitely prioritize safety first. Um, but I think with monoclonal, safety is usually not as big of an issue, and usually it's in the efficacy in phase two when they start actually putting into a patient population that they just see this doesn't do anything. Historically, going back to Farber, the four gases he was using, uh, cancer, chemo uh, cancer therapeutics were so horrendously toxic that you couldn't ethically go into health these. You, you couldn't just uh, pay some college kids to, to see what it does. Uh, you were only going into patients. So historically, cancer has been uh, skewed. Um, you're, you're starting looking at safety with people who are actively dying, but they're the only ones you're allowed to recruit. So, so it sounds like the efficacy issue is maybe you have the wrong targets, not because you're not getting the right hand. You're not having trouble generating a successful antibody to a target. You're just getting the wrong target. Um. Yes, that's definitely the case, and that goes back to like the whole personal side of things. Like, as much as we want to characterize all the cancers into one lump, but each individual is going to have different different um, responses, and and there's a lot of details with like how the target works too, because how many copy number is how many copies of the target is on a certain cell. Is there like a threshold where you have to be above a certain threshold in order for it to be efficacious? Um, it, might have to do with like the immune system. How does that respond in regards to this target? Um, I guess yeah. That, that's the main thing with biology is that it's it's so complicated. And once you learn something about biology, there's always more that, yeah. that just like kind of <laughs> the <Pandora's> yeah. <laughs> and doom. Right. So anything like oh, we have this human genome. We know everything about ourselves now. No, no, we just open more and more can of worms. <laughs> well, I know like the ideal drug for like a bi-specific or like if you were to produce a uh, ideal Y specific antibody. It would be something that is super, like something that's expressed super upregulated on the cancer cells, but not on your healthy cells. So, like, you're kind of looking for this unicorn glycoprotein that you can produce an antibody for, and then, like, it tags along, it's grabbing an immune cell to bring with it, and so you're also taking it to the site of the cancer. And then, if those cells are long lived, you're, that's circulating, and so if it's metastatic, or like if there's the possibility of you know, if you go into remission, but oh shit, here it is, it comes back again, you know, like th those cells are already there and they can respond in kind. So like that's kind of your ideal, but trying to find this said unicorn when the process of cancer is to turn on just genes at whimsy, like whatever we want, like we're just gonna go in there and like a bull in a china shop and turn on whatever the hell, like, and then we have to figure out whatever the hell is. <laughs> so it's kind of difficult because you're looking for something that's so specific uh, in so much data. And that's why PE1 is so exciting because that's not looking at this, this mutating mess that is the cancer. Right. It's looking at something which you hope is constant. Yeah. <laughs> right. Cancer has to keep that one stable somehow, mm -hmm. usually. Because Often enough. Right. In because some <laughs> cancers. <laughs> because yeah, we'll, we'll find out what's wrong with that argument, but it's attractive right, right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the cancers will teach us how you get around that. It's, it's, it's almost that it's not like cancer is smarter than us, it's just that it's like, like... So it's really these, all of these experiments. All yeah, it's like yeah. a pollock painting, it's just like, uh, whatever! <laughs> and most of those are lethal and the cancer doesn't care. Yeah, it's just so random that you're trying to make sense of like a convoluted mess, yeah. So, it's a challenge. Cancer's evolving, just like, you know, HIV's really hard to deal with too because it's just constantly evolving. And you can kill 99% of the cancer, but if that 1% then mutates into some, something else, now you have a completely new physiology and your previous drug won't work on it. <clears throat> yeah, so we're always chasing after something that might not even be there. <laughs> yeah.